for your interest in our webinar recording regarding the automation of the requisition process in SAP. Before we start, uh, let me introduce the two speakers to you. My name is Gisela Krush, and I'm responsible for marketing our financial process automation solutions in Europe. And Art is our product marketing director for financial process automation. Um, Art, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Gisela. As product marketing director, I'm focused on developing the marketing requirements and the marketing content for Process Director AP for SAP and other FPA solutions, including requisitions and payment advice processing. Our FPA team covers the full range of FPA solutions within Lexmark. Okay, thank you. So we will conduct this webinar in an interview style. And I'll, uh, let's, uh, let's get started right away. So um, our process director customers know the solution from the AP process perspective. This is now part of what we call FPA, which stands for Financial Process Automation. Can you describe how we define FPA within the Lexmark and how the requisitions processing fits in the FPA solutions for SAP? Thank you. Yeah, FPA, or financial process automation, uh, really has two meanings. One is, of course, the general term financial process automation, which refers to the major processes that cover the financial process scope. And also, it refers to our division, the financial processing automation team. So in terms of the scope of financial process automation, the first major process is procure to pay, and this is where the requisitioning fits. This is where buyers and sellers trade information, the most information, as a matter of fact. This includes accounts payable and requisitioning, which we're going to be talking about. The next major process is order to cash. This is a process for enabling faster, more accurate handling of receivables. The goal here is to reduce a day's sales outstanding, or DSO and permit access to current information about customer payments. The record to report process, the final process, is the one that we use for closing transactions, for bringing data such as transferring journal entries for end of period financial reporting. So this covers the entire scope, and our solutions really address all of these, and they're being implemented to evolve further to cover most of these processes as we go forward. So how do we define the P2P process life cycle, and where does uh, requisitioning fit within this cycle? Yes, well, requisitioning uh, is part of the procure-to-pay process, and this consists of all of the activities between identifying the need to purchase goods or services, so this is the sourcing and the contracting aspects of the process. And we really don't focus on that because that's pretty well covered in the market. Our focus really is on the requisitioning and the receiving and the invoices and the payment. So once we uh, identify the need to purchase goods and services, we, of course, then have to address collecting and paying for the goods. So each bubble on this diagram represents a very large and complex process. Our current focus in FPA begins after the sourcing and contracting, as I said, with the requisitioning process through the invoice, which is addressed by the AP solution, and finally clearing for payments with payment advice and remittance advice processing. So, of course, these processes re require supporting processes to assure that we're working with the right supplier, we have the proper insight through reporting and analytics, and we have the proper logging and auditing of all activities for compliance and for historical record keeping. So let's take a look at the requisition process. You notice here that it begins with the buyer filling out a purchase requisition in Process Director. And of course, the Process Director solution is integrated with the SAP catalog or some third-party catalogs to be able to address filling out the requisition with materials and or adding manual transactions such as consulting and other information on the requisition that could be used. And then finally, uh, we have a process where the requisition then has to be validated in terms of material content. It then has to be proved. And then finally, the purchase order is uh, issued. 
In terms of um, procurement, could you describe the various spending categories and some of the challenges uh, our customers face? Sure. Well, there's two major categories. The direct spend, which covers the purchase of raw goods and materials to support production. And because these go right into finished goods sold to the customer, this is usually covered through the applications that the customer is using, such as SAP, of course. And then the indirect spend covers the purchasing of all materials and services that don't go directly into the finished goods sold. And this is the area where we focus on initially because it represents what we refer to as maverick spend, the ability of someone to purchase just ad hoc. And of course, this indirect purchasing is happening throughout the entire company. So some procurement executives believe that uh, spend is spend, regardless of whether it consists of direct or indirect. In reality, the indirect procurement of services is a different universe compared to the direct. The whole organizational culture and the landscape on the indirect side has many nuances that you don't see on the direct side. And by that, I mean the processes are typically not well defined because anyone has authority to initiate a transaction. So the procurement executive kind of needs to look at this area and see if he can uh, establish some strategies to be able to reduce cost and improve the whole process. <clears throat> Can you give us some additional examples for indirect purchasing, which is, as you mentioned already, uh, the part that our solution um, addresses? Yeah, absolutely. Here you see some typical examples. Uh, the first one, MRO, which is maintenance, repair, and operations. This concern can consumables, electric supplies, capital equipment, uniforms, safety equipment. And then we have travel, uh, IT and telecom expenses. Uh, property, professional services, transportation. So across this whole spectrum, there is a mix of both indirect and direct spending categories. So for example, in a material and maintenance and repair, one could initiate a transaction to just buy perhaps a, you know, a belt or a pair of pants for a uniform, and this, of course, would be an indirect spend, and anyone could initiate that transaction. So we're trying to control this across the whole spectrum of the indirect procurement categories. So in addition here, uh, as you can see from the slide, although the average indirect spend might represent only 33% of the spend, the transaction volume is very significant, which implies a great use case for automating many of the manual activities as well as effectively managing what is commonly called maverick spending. These are purchases made without the involvement of procurement and typically without complying to contracts or existing processes. The indirect spend has often been historically decentralized, and it's very siloed throughout the organization. So how can our customers better assess their indirect spend activities? Well, I think the first thing is to identify the key internal stakeholders, that is, the people who have reporting structures that roll up to them that they would need to intercede in order to approve these expenses. And then map out these distinctive characteristics. In other words, conduct a gap analysis to identify potential opportunities for improvement. And you know that some of the key areas we have here, we're looking at how much do we spend on indirect purchasing. A lot of companies don't know this. How much do we spend on direct? Much easier to assess. What is our volume? What are the ratios? We typically find that uh, the indirect spend transaction ratios are much, much higher. They represent, as I said, about 70% of the transaction volume. And then we look at average costs, some of the differences, and look at the opportunity for perhaps negotiating these prices. This is a sweet spot to be able to negotiate some of these items that are otherwise characterized as indirect spend. <clears throat> so as we move forward, some of the challenges in managing indirect spend, I'll go through a couple of these for you. Uh, the manual processes, as you can imagine, are very error-prone and time-consuming. 
uh, because they're manual. So therefore, they lend themselves to a lot of error, transposition, uh, syntax errors. Um, they're viewed by the company as less strategic because they fall under a threshold. So for example, somebody might have uh, an average per diem that they might be able to spend, which might be able to be lowered or change in order to control some cost. So everybody understands the value of strict and strong management and direct spend, but they don't realize the value of managing their indirect spend. So it's kind of a chicken and egg scenario. In other words, they don't have the visibility, but at the same time, if you do have the visibility, it makes managing indirect spend a priority within the company all of a sudden where it wasn't in the past. And then, of course, there's a lot more suppliers. Uh, the suppliers are much broader in most cases than, in, than the direct spend uh, because you're just basically doing ad hoc transactions. So in order to mitigate the excessive cost that's associated with indirect spend, you try to build strong relationships so that you can manage this. And then, of course, um, you know that there are a lot of smaller purchases more frequently. This means that the number of transactions can become very, very significant. And then finally, um, the stakeholders can include anyone in the company. Anyone can initiate a transaction for this. So, so what are the main sorry, what are the main benefits of the our requisition solution? Well, what our goals in developing this solution were to control the generation of the requisition, all requisitions. In other words, that we would add a, a, a discipline around the management of a requisition process. We would also inject an approval cycle where all transactions had to go through an approval process. Now, because there are so many of them, we want to make this as automated as possible. And of course, we have to have dynamic access to the catalogs that people are using so that they have access immediately to some of the materials and supplies that they're going to be ordering. And we also have to be able to have automated determination of some of the supporting transactions that you need in order to process a requisition. So for example, the purchase order GL account, general ledger account, the determination of the vendor, make sure that the vendor is valid. And then we have a bunch of checks before this order is created. We want to be able to validate that all of the data has integrity before we start to process it. And along the way, we want to be able to trace and audit any exceptions and all of these transactions throughout the process. So finally, we have now a flexible control of the entire process through simplified integration. <clears throat> Another benefit, of course, is that our solution is SAP certified, and this is critical. It's often a rite of passage for a company to have this certification. This means that we have increased our efficiency because the integration between our acquisition system and SAP is following standard and approved protocols. It allows us to reduce the learning curve for the customer, not have any impact on their existing infrastructure, and this results in a very low total cost of ownership. So we have a solution that is compliant, that is validated, very easy to install, very easy to implement, very low learning curve, and a very low total cost of ownership. And from this, we derive a significant number of benefits for the user. They now have a better basis for price. Uh, suppliers are now being able to be negotiated with. Uh, we can start to try to reduce our cost for purchasing logistics. Uh, we have an improved process for processing the invoices that are generated from these uh, uh, requisitions coming in from the supplier. Uh, we have full reporting. We have optimized our ability to pick and choose suppliers that would give us the best price. We've leveraged our SAP infrastructure, and we've generated a complete lower total cost of ownership for the solution. OK, thank you, Art. Um, let's have a look at a real-life example of Process Director with uh, requisitions. Yes, of course. We'll drill down into the requisition process, and I'm going to approach this by using a persona-based example. I think this gives us a good way of illustrating the steps that can be implemented to assure optimal automated processing. 
And to give you an overview, just as a reminder, you know that the process begins with a requisition. The requisition then is validated through the supplier, through our SAP accounting activity. It then needs to be approved, and finally the purchase order is issued. And this is not as simple as it seems in order in to implement, but uh, let's go through this using an example. So we'll begin by introducing three players or personas that would be involved in an example. And this could vary. Could be two, could be three, it could be more than that. Dave is representing the buyer, and he's going to raise the requisition. Could be anyone in the company that has the ability to purchase on an indirect basis. So Dave is in marketing, and Roger is his manager. And of course, he's going to be used for approving the requisition. He could delegate this. Uh, he might be off on vacation. So you start to see the complexity built into this process as we start to look at the variation and the exceptions. And then finally, Barbara, who is in procurement, has final approval, and she's going to create the supporting purchase order. So Dave, uh, who is not experienced in SAP, and as you know, the learning curve within SAP can be very, very significant. And for these casual users, we wanted to provide them with an interface that would be convenient, comfortable, and familiar. So Dave now prefers to use Process Director's web interface to interact with the requisition application. So he begins, and he logs into Process Director. And as soon as he logs into Process Director, Dave is presented with a work list. This is a list of some of the transactions that uh, may be implemented within Process Director, and those that he has access to are shown. And you notice that uh, Purchase Order is now the one that uh, he is going to be working on. So he's presented with it, and he selects it. He then gets a Quick Start menu from which he can create a requisition. <clears throat> Dave then populates the form the requisition template that is all pre-configured for him uh, from an electronic catalog. In this example, he chooses a template. And you'll notice that uh, down below, he has added a consulting services line. So we start to see that the requisition can actually be a mix of both material from the catalog and manual entries, such as consulting and other activities that might be over and above what is available in the catalog. And we call this kind of a free form capability. Uh, the catalog that he's selecting, he will use to populate his shopping cart. Notice that we're using the open catalog interface from SAP. This is a standard protocol that's provided that incorporates the ability to externally access product catalogs from our application or from the server, the SAP server. This way, data that is required to create the shopping cart can be transferred directly from the catalog to our server. So there's a tight coupling between these transactions and the system. And you know also that selecting some of these items may have an effect on inventory as well. So there's a direct interface between the FI module or the financial integration or in module and the material management module. So items can be selected from one or many e-procurement catalogs or even online shops using this, or the user can go directly into the SAP Material Master to develop the shopping catalog. <clears throat> and finally, the shopping card is created. And as we can see, we've leveraged self-service procurement. We've blended both manual and e-catalog entries in this case. And you look at the line items, we have consulting services. We're ordering a mouse pad. We're adding a keyboard draw. All of these are coming from the catalog combined with the manual entry of the services. So the bottom line, of course, is that um, self-service procurement empowers employees to easily shop for goods and services. Shopping carts relieve the purchasing department of huge administration burden while making the procurement process faster and more responsive. So the requisition is populated with predefined values. This is very important because it reduces the data entry and the manual process. So if you're using the material master, the material group and the order unit is displayed, the company code is taken from the purchasing organization that the buyer is in, uh, currency and payment terms are taken from the vendor master, uh, any tax implications are determined, 
Uh, the data checks that are provided include the data formatting, the company code, the purchasing organization, uh, all of this kind of activity from the OCI catalogs. So now Dave can choose uh, Roger Tillman as an approver for the transaction. Uh, however, we've automated this. Uh, there's an additional second step once the uh, approver is selected where the user assignment is automatically done by process director. So there doesn't have to be a, a kind of thinking about who can approve this. And this, again, is very subtle because the approver model could be tied to specific classes of requisition types. So in effect, it may or may not be the same approver. In this case, we're using a simplistic example. But keep in mind that this can become very complex. In this case, Roger Tillman is Dave's manager. And Roger has to approve the purchase before the purchase order is created. And he's also going to approve the associated invoice. So from his end, he's going to get a notification about the new requisition waiting for his approval. And he'll see that in his work list. And then Roger will then review that, and he will inform purchasing that he really wants to expedite this so there is an urgency. So he's going to attach to the transaction a note and approve the request. So the document moves to the approved node in the system so that we can get it into the workflow and move it through the process. And Roger can also follow the progress of the request through the My Workflow history that he has in the work list. So he knows exactly what the state is. And of course, if we take a quick look at the workflow status, we now see that Barbara has been assigned as the processor. This, again, is a determination that is made based on the type of transaction, the type of materials being ordered, and the whole approval uh, hierarchy that has been established by the company. So now that uh, Dave, the buyer, has raised the purchase requisition and his manager approved it, what's the next step in the process? Exactly. So the next step in the process, of course, is that Barbara is going to do the final approval in procurement, and she will create the purchase order. She'll use this using our SAP graphical user interface which is the preferred way of working for professional users. Again, these are not experienced SAP users, and we want to be able to give them a facility uh, that makes it very easy to interact with the system. So Barbara's inbox, when she starts to look at it, will alert her to show an item to handle for her in the SAP interface. So Barbara will see that. She'll look at her workflow qu uh, tasks, and she will open the request to review it. So as soon as she uh, opens the document, the detail screen will be a mirror image of the actual requisition. She'll see all of the relevant data that she needs to. She can edit the data and send back additional comments. She can choose a different supplier. Uh, this, again, shows the interlock between procurement and the buyer. Uh, where procurement has an oversight responsibility. They can look at this. They might suggest some different options to in order to mitigate or reduce cost. Uh, she looks at it quickly, and in this case, uh, it looks OK. So she opens the document, and uh, she sees the note uh, of urgency from Roger. Urgent requisition. We need the consultants on site as soon as possible. So we want to move this. So it's escalated. She needs to approve it. So she now goes through and makes one more choice, which is basically the approval. And then finally, once she approves it, the PO is automatically created, now ready to be printed and sent to the supplier using the SAP standard print options. And the purchase order can be easily accessed from our process director solution just by clicking on the PO number. And of course, we provide full traceability from the workflow log that is attached to the generated PO. So note that from one requisition, one or more purchase orders could have been created. For example, if the requisition created uh, had multiple vendors, we may want to create more than one purchase order, of course. You can flip their orders, and by that we mean the ability to take a purchase order directly into a goods receipt transaction 
Some of you may be familiar with a PO flip, where we can take a purchase order and flip it into an invoice. We can also flip this requisition directly into a goods receipt transaction from its order, and this is a basis for goods receipt posting. So all of this is provided by the solution. And in addition, a complete workflow log is attached to give us a complete audit of all of the transactions and the activities that have happened throughout the process. So now Dave comes back and he can review the purchase order, create a confirmation or a goods receipt using his browser. And by doing that, he generates the prerequisites for doing a three-way match. Obviously, we want to be able to take the invoice that is generated, match it to the purchase order, and match it to the receipt once this invoice comes in. This is referred to as a three-way match. Everything has been set up in order to accommodate this in an automatic fashion. So the supporting document that's created uh, has been created. Uh, the completed process is now finished. Dave has easily created the request. He's got full transparency of the entire process. Roger, his manager in this case, has approved it and has full control of the spending. And Barbara has been completely satisfied because she's assured that the established process has been followed. So it's a great example of the interaction between the various groups in order to control the cost and address this, this area of indirect spend, which is greatly overlooked within an organization. <clears throat> Absolutely. Thank you, Art, for the demo. What can organizations expect in terms of ROI for the requisition solution? Excellent question. I have two examples here. One is just some studies that have been done by Gartner and Hackett. Uh, notice that they, they agree that a third of the total spending comes from indirect spend. So we have an opportunity here to manage that. We know that a lot of it is maverick, where ordering can be done over the phone. And we know that the purchases made with these uh, maverick spends is a lot higher. In fact, it can be up to 35% higher compared to prices that could be negotiated. And also, the transaction cost um, is excessive. It can be between $20 and $30 per transaction. Now, think about that based on the number of indirect spend transactions uh, a typical company might have in the thousands. And we can reduce this average processing cost, we believe, with the automation solution by as much as $10 per transaction. Of course, that's going to be different depending on the company and the processes that are implemented. But we're using a model that says the average spend and indirect spend and in maverick purchasing can be improved around 10%. So this is an important number. And this example that I'm about to show you illustrates that. So here we have an example of return on investment, uh, which is actual. And we have a company that has a total spend of direct and indirect spend of $325 million. And of that, 14%, which is about 6,000 purchase orders, are indirect. This represents about $45.5 million US of total indirect spend. And 25% of this is undisciplined, though we would say maverick. And that would represent about $11 million in maverick spend. So that's about 1,500 orders which give you a value of about $7,000 per order. If we had a $10 reduction in processing cost for the 6,000 indirect spends just through automation, we get a savings of about $60,000. Not very exciting uh, given the level of total spend. However, if we have a 10% price improvement on our Maverick spend, we can generate a savings of over a million dollars. This becomes very significant. So you'll notice that there's a lot of opportunity that we can gain by following an established process that can be improved. Perhaps the stuff is coming in through paper or an email, doesn't have visibility. Staff can start spending time on high-value work items like price negotiations or supplier rationalization and don't have to uh, focus on this kind of, of a process that we can automate. And we can also handle direct spend. But in general, when all the spending is managed through Process Director combined with the SAP solution, you have a comprehensive overview of all purchasing, which gives you the potential to improve the total product and supplier and bring visibility into both direct and indirect spending 
and improve your profitability and affect your cost management in a positive way. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for your attention and for following this webinar recording. We're happy to discuss this topic further with you. If you have any questions or would like to go into more detail, please contact Art um, with the email address that is shown. Thank you. Thank you.